This weekend, we complete our study in the Gospel of John. This study has taken uh, 14 months and 44 messages to complete. It's been a great study. John's mission is to tell the story of Jesus Christ. The book starts with the fact that He is God and that He has existed for all eternity, but came down to earth to call us to be a part of His kingdom. Another Gospel writer, Matthew, says that he came preaching primarily about His kingdom. He wants us to get this. I have saved John 14, verses 1 to 13, the text that we're looking at this weekend, for this last message in the series, because it so clearly articulates the voice of God for each one of us. So my first point is, we need to become followers of Jesus if we are to be a part of His kingdom family. So we are all born into a biological family. Our families on earth are wonderful gifts of God, but you know what? They're temporary and they're fragile, often broken by dysfunction, divorce, sometimes distance, and inevitably death. So God says, let me introduce you to my kingdom family, which will be a real blessing to you now and for all eternity. In order to be a part of his family, we need to be born again spiritually. So early on in Jesus' ministry, written in John chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus tells us, very truly, I tell you, no one can come to the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now he's speaking to Nicodemus, who was a religious leader. But poor Nicodemus doesn't get it. And he says to Jesus, what do you mean? And Jesus replied, it's a spiritual birth. And so for further understanding of what it means to be born again, there's a link under this video with the sermon notes. Click on that link and you will find how to be born again into the family of God. Now you need to remember, every human being was created by God, but not everyone is a child of God. You see, we are all invited but only those who respond to God's call are a part of the family of God, a family where God is our Father. Others who are born again are, in the Bible are called our brothers and sisters. The church is simply a gathering of all who have joined the family. Now let's go back to the link, uh, this information sheet that I've shown you earlier. First of all, this will give, help you understand how to be born again into the family of God. So first of all, number one, you need to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the only way to God and that you need Him in your life. And here's a verse from this passage that we're looking at today, John 14, 6. And it says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Secondly, you need to be willing to turn from the things that God would not approve of as outlined in the Bible, and instead decide to live according to His Word. Honor Jesus Christ by how we live our lives. Number three, we need to believe that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross and rose from the grave and accept His payment on our behalf. Now, believe is a very used very often in the Bible, and it's a very big word. It means to follow or to put all of your life behind His. Number four, through prayer, invite Jesus Christ audibly to come into your life. Expect the Holy Spirit to live with you, live in you, and give you the power to live His way. Now, there's a model prayer at the bottom of this sheet as well. And I would ask you to pray that out loud and add whatever you would like to say to God and begin this relationship and begin it with prayer. And you can talk to God just like we're talking here. Let me say this. If you have acknowledged, turned, believed, and invited Jesus into your life, let us know that as a church. Give us a call and we will help you to grow and mature in your spiritual life. Now, we discussed in point number one that we need to become followers of Jesus if we are to be a part of His kingdom family. Second point I want to make is being part of His family means we will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. 
Now in John chapter 13, Jesus announces at the Last Supper that within a few hours, he is going to die. The disciples are disturbed by that. And so in John chapter 14 and verse 1, he comforts his disciples. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled by this news. Now, most of us would be troubled if a close friend said to us, I'm going to be dying shortly. It's just human nature. It's a human response. We're fearful because it's unknown territory. But Jesus is not concerned. And as we read this passage, I think you'll agree, I believe he's homesick and he wants to be back in heaven with his father. He excitedly says in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. But if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus is simply saying, we're moving and we're moving to a much better place. Now, I remember the look on my kids' faces when I announced, we're moving to Alberta from Saskatchewan. From Meadow Lake to Sherwood Park, a community of 5,500 to a community of 80,000. And I assured my kids, hey, this is going to be a great place. Uh, We're going to be close to West Edmonton Mall. They had been shopping there. We're going to go, we're going to be close to TELUS World of Science. They had been there. Hey, we're going to be in the same community as the Oilers. And you're going to get to go to McDonald's. Well, there was fear in their eyes. And they said, what about my friends and my school and my church and the home I'm used to, my cat? Well, that was all they knew. But I assured them, hey, don't worry. This will be a great adventure. You'll have a new home. You'll have a new school. You'll have new friends. Same cat, same parents. And so the kids were pretty excited and they were pretty relaxed about the move. We went on, my wife and I, and bought a house, and we came back to take them to be with us that they might be where we are. Well, the kids handled the move really well, but the cat. Well, she was a lot like Thomas in this passage. In verse 5, Thomas said this. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Well, he's worried. And the cat was worried. And the cat hid in the back of the van, and every mile or so we heard this, and you've probably heard this big yell, Whoa! And so for the next month, it'll be deep in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden we hear this, Whoa! This mournful sound of our cat. Well, I hate to tell you this, but the cat's gone, but the kids love it here. Nobody ever wanted to go back. And I'm 100% positive that we're going to feel the same way about heaven. A couple of months ago, I read a book called Imagine Heaven. And the author, John Burke, for decades, had been studying accounts of survivors brought back from near death who lived to tell of heavenly and hellish experiences. There were doctors, college professors, bank presidents, people of all ages and cultures, Uh, And they painted an exhilarating picture of heaven, promised to followers of Christ. And I was astonished by quite a number of things. But here's just a few things that really resonated with me. I was surprised how many people he found to interview. I was surprised how similar their stories were. I was surprised how many Christians did not want to come back. In fact, very few. I was surprised that those, uh, there were those who had a really terrible experience of hell. I was surprised by the profound change it made in people's lives as they come back to earth. Very different people. Now, I would recommend the read to you. Jesus doesn't tell us a lot about heaven in this passage that we're looking at, nor does he in the book of John. 
In verse 5, Thomas, it says, is concerned and scared. And you know, you may be concerned and scared today, but Jesus gives these assuring words. He says, trust in me. Trust my Father. In verse 6, Jesus says very clearly, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now I take you back to to that information sheet, how to be born again into the family of God. Well, this is the way that Jesus is referring to in this verse. And I want to say to you, know the way. Memorize the way so that you can help others find their way to the family of God. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Now, amid all of the questions that we naturally have concerning the new heavens and the new earth, we must not lose sight of the fact that Scripture consistently portrays heaven as a place of great beauty and joy. Revelation 21 and 22 are rich in the description of heaven. First of all, they would tell us in chapter 21, it's a holy city. You need to know that. But you also need to know that when you join the family of God, the Bible says we are wrapped in Jesus' holiness in preparation for the holy city. We don't have a lot of holiness ourselves, but we can be wrapped in Jesus' holiness. And then in chapter 21, verse 4, it says, He, He will wipe, that's Jesus, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Speaks about heaven's radiance will be like a most rare jewel in verse 11. Heaven will be free from all evil, falsehood, and injustice. Verse 27 says that. We will enjoy meeting loved ones, ancestors who walked with Jesus while on this earth centuries ago. Babies lost in childbirth. Ones we never got a chance to meet. People from all nations and even Bible characters. And then in the next chapter, Revelation 22, 4, it says, we will see his face. Finally. No longer the way the Bible speaks of seeing God as through a glass dimly, but we will look into Jesus' face and feel his infinite love. In the face of God, we will see the fulfillment of all the longing that we have ever known. And we will know perfect love, peace, joy. And there will be truth and justice. We will see it in action. There will be holiness and wisdom, goodness and power, glory and beauty. Wow, what a day that's going to be. What an eternity that will be. Let's go to point number three. But let me review one and two. Uh, We need to become followers of Jesus if we are to be a part of his kingdom family. That was point number one. Point number two, being part of his family means we will spend eternity with Jesus. That's point number two. Point number three, where we will know and see our heavenly father face to face. You know, Jesus came to introduce us to the head of the family, God the Father. He's a really big deal in the Bible, but he's only referenced 15 times as our Father in the Old Testament. 165 times, that's quite a few in the New Testament, but do you realize that a hundred of those references are in the Gospel of John that we've been studying over this last uh, 14 months? Listen as Jesus refers to his Father 11 times in these seven verses. Let me read John 14, 7 to 13 to you. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, that will, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have, have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? 
Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on, by my, on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I tell you that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do, listen to this, even greater things than these. Wow. Because I am going to the Father. Verse 13, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now I'm aware that our experience of, of our earthly father may not be a good one. And the sad fact is that our view of God our Father is often tainted by our experience with our earthly father. Now, my heart goes out to those who were abused, wounded, both body and soul, by an uncaring, mean, domineering, angry, overbearing father. Or maybe you experience the other extreme of a passive or an absent father makes me sad these days that the media portrays fathers as tired, not very bright, passive, not emotionally healthy. And there seems to be no respect in our society for fathers, but they are usually the brunt of jokes. A father wound these days is very common and real for many in this world. And as families blow apart, it's getting worse. We are impacted by our fathers probably more than any other human being on this earth. And this has been true down through the ages. If you ask people on the street or people throughout history, how, how do you see God the Father? I believe that most would say, oh, he's angry. He's a tired old guy in the sky, the long beard and the white hair. Kind of sad. And there's been false beliefs that have sprung up through the centuries. And they're still alive and well today and still with us. And it goes like this. Because God is so angry and Jesus is so busy, you should pray to Mary and she will convince God to hear and answer your prayers. Oh, it's so sad that God is represented this way. John doesn't present the God the Father this way. Jesus loves God the Father. And he talks a lot about God the Father. And he's always talking him up. And the Gospels speak of a rich relationship between the Father and the Son. I get a sense that Jesus misses his Father desperately. And misses his heavenly home. So remember, Jesus came from heaven. He spent 33 years on this earth. It wasn't a great experience. He may have said, this isn't hell, but I think I can see it from here. Both places have the same leader and ideology. Poor Jesus was confined to this fallen human body. Aches and pains, tears, heartache and death. While Jesus was here, he was constantly bullied by Satan, similar to what we are. Jesus was betrayed by friends, friends that he loved. And as soon as the tough times hit, they ran. He must have had enough of bad food. Heaven food is better. Uh, hot days, I've been to Israel. Maybe it was cats that howled all night. Whoa! Now he's hours away from being back together with his heavenly father. Jesus really wants us to view our Heavenly Father, not through the lens of our earthly father, but through uh, the lens of what Jesus was like. Jesus said, we've lived life together. Look through this lens of who I am and you'll see the Father. As we've studied John, there's no better picture of Jesus. Loving, gentle, anything but passive, truthful, honest. He lives with integrity. He's responsive, not absent. He cares deeply. 
and is interested in all of us. He has a preferred future for all of us. Again, verses 9 and 10, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. This image of the Father may be one of the most important journeys you will ever take in the kingdom family. Here's some few, few suggestions on how to get the image of, of God in a respectful way. Number one, read the book of John again. And take notes on Jesus' character and apply them to your image of your Heavenly Father. Secondly, pray that the Holy Spirit will help you move beyond the father wound that you carry. And thirdly, don't be afraid to phone the church and to receive prayer ministry with pastors Craig and Joy. So in conclusion, I want to say, I had a pretty good earthly father. But in many ways, because my father wasn't perfect, he set me up to fail in some aspects of the kingdom of God. And it has actually taken years of continuing to draw closer to God, that's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to see my heavenly father for who he truly is. As fathers, we have a serious role to play. We represent our Heavenly Father to our kids, even though we're imperfect dads. But God would love to help us with that. And so this passage, this book of John, and the whole Bible, is God saying to us, I've got this. I can help you through life. I invite you into my family that we would spend eternity together. And I want you to know my dad. John 14, 1, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Simply believe, follow God, and follow me. Now, at the end of every service, we love to bless one another around here. And so I would ask you to hold your hands out like this. And I want to bless you with a verse taken out of Jude. And this is Jude 24. And here's what it says. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a good weekend. 